Evening. Uh, we have got David Hulse uh, with us. Now, a year or so ago, he gave us a talk and brought in one of his one of these one of his marvellous models. And uh, we've got another opportunity with a different engine tonight. So, uh, David Hulse is a retired engineer um, and uh, splendid model engineer. Um, the uh, he's been with us uh, as a member for a long time and spoken to us. Several times now, I think three, three, four times, four, four yeah, um, on the various uh, engines that he's made models of, which um, tend to be the fairly early ones. Um, I think this is probably about the the cutoff point. This one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so he's going to be telling us about the research on the, on this example of a Trevithick engine and a little of how he made the model. Um, and finally, he'll be letting letting us see it run. Um, he is a retired uh, engineer who used to work for Royal Dilton in Stoke-on-Trent, and um, so very much experience in the ceramics and porcelain industry. And uh, but his hobby has been these uh, steam engines, and he's made these wonderful models. So I think we're gonna, he'll explain. But we're going to see a video about. His model making for first, yeah, for about ten minutes, and then uh, then he'll give us the main talk. So, David. Yeah. Yes. Just before I start to talk about Richard Trevithick, I'd just like to introduce myself with the video that you'll see for about ten minutes. It explains what I set out to do, and I set out to make these models in 1970, and I've really been doing it ever since. I've been making the models and researching them and writing about them. So more, no more to do, we'll start with the video. I've always made things, ne never stopped. There's never a day goes by that I don't make something. The, the first thing that I ever made, I made a coffee table with all turned legs and turned top. The only thing was that I made the lathe first to make the table at the age of 10. My name is David Hulse. In my working life, I was the chief development engineer for Royal Dalton. My day was spent designing automatic machines used for the pottery process. For the past 45 years, I've been constructing in miniature eight of the most important engines which were made during the 18th century. I've got a gift for designing machines. I've never done anything else. I've got this creative urge and I discovered uh, that no engines which were made during the 18th century had ever been made in great detail by anyone. That is the task that I actually did set myself and I've done it. started to make these models in 1970. Many people ask me, how ever can you spend so much time making these items? My answer to that is, how long have you spent watching the television? And look what I've got. I 
I like to discover how these engines worked. The research has taken a considerable amount of time, almost in, the, in one or two cases, as long as it has taken to make the models. When the, these models are made, that is how they were. And I know it is correct. You've got to get yourself into a very, very peaceful frame of mind to make these items so small. And uh, because they've all got to function, and they, they all do function exactly how they would have done 16 times bigger than I'm making them. Every item on every engine is individually handmade. Every nut, pin and washer on every engine is handmade. The, the workshop that I've uh, created to make these models is uh, specifically done for the models themselves. The, the lathe that I use is 116 years old. It is ideally suited for making pins as small as 40 thousandths of an inch diameter, right up into the, the larger ones, which are five millimeters in diameter. Every one of the thousands of bricks that I've made have been made on a machine that I designed for the purpose. So far, the eight models have consumed 151,000 bricks. Originally these engines would have been made from English oak, but the one thing that you can't do when you're making models of this scale is use English oak, because the thing is to, to make them realistic, you've got to scale the grain as well. So all the, the wood used on the models is Japanese oak, which is much, much slower growing and, and much closer grained. And it almost looking at the wood as I've scaled the grain as well. The, the, the engines that I've got, that I've made, there is no original plans done. I've done them all. I was on my own. No one else was doing this. No one else was bricklaying <laughs> at a 16th full size, especially bricks they made themselves. These models are absolutely unique. It's not often the word unique can be used with such confidence. It's not often in life that you can find something that you want to make that hasn't been done before. I'd got the necessary knowledge and skills to make these and, you, and I found great enjoyment to come home at night when I got home from work and construct these engines, transporting my mind back into the 18th century using the knowledge that I knew they would have had. It gives you an appreciation just how skilled some of the men were to have created these items because they are mechanical wonders. All these engines are the ones that change the world and the way we, we live in the world today. Every mechanical device we take so much for granted owes its existence to these engines.
they're, they're such important engines. I was so uh, anxious that they should be correct because when, uh, they, when I'm not around, people will be able to see these engines and be assured that is exactly how it was. Hopefully they'll have a, an understanding the, the research that's gone into them, the skill to make them, and also appreciate the, the great skill and knowledge that's gone into the construction of the engines during the 18th century, and give the inventors the, the credit they so richly deserve. The engine that I want to talk to you about this evening was made in 1804, designed by Richard Trevithick, the Cornish engineer. Richard Trevithick was, was born on the, the 13th of April, 1771, in the Thatch Cottage in front of South Crofty Mine here. The engine that you, that you see in the background is Robinson's 85, 85 being 85 inches diameter, the powering cylinder. Unfortunately, the, the thatch cottage that you see there doesn't exist anymore. All, all that is there is the, this memorial stone marking the spot where the cottage was first once stood. Now, much of Richard Trevithick's early, early life was spent at Penn Ponds, near to, uh, to Camborne, and th this is a cottage, also a thatch cottage where he spent much of his childhood and a lot of his adult life. It's now in the trust, in the National Trust, and has opened on special occasions to, to uh, and there's quite a number of artifacts to see relating to Trevithick and his father, also Richard. So that is, uh, on the outskirts of Camborne. And I, I would just, before we get on to talking about Trevithick specifically, I'd just like to show you one, of the, one or two of the Cornish engines that are around that area. Uh, the, the, the portrait you see on the left is Richard Trevithick as a young man. The, the one on the right is uh, uh, in adult life and he's supposed to be a very, very powerful figure. The D Dalcoth mine is where Richard Trevithick's father w w was the, the mine manager, and is where Richard Trevithick, as a young man, spent much of, of his childhood learning about mining in that particular area uh, of, the, of, of Cornwall. He said he was, it, it is said that he was not particularly good at uh, academia, at, in school at all, but did start to excel when he saw particular problems at, at the mine. And uh, this is where the seed was born for his great uh, engineering future. So this, this is the, the Dalcoth mine. Now, I've put this one in just to show engines in Cornwall. The, the one that you see here is, is a winding engine which would have been, which was built in, in 18, 1860 to haul copper ore from the, uh, from the mine workings, which uh, in the mine extended almost three miles under the sea. So this was a winding engine and this w was, uh, a pumping engine to keep the mine clear of water. But the next uh, slide shows you how big these really were. Th this, this engine here had got a 90-inch cylinder, 
and by, and by 1860 they were working with a steam pressure of about 100 pounds per square inch. Now 100 pounds per square inch on a 90 inch cylinder would have given a lift of almost 300 tons, 293 tons. They also put a vacuum on the underside of the piston so effectively it had got a, a working pressure of well over 100 pounds per square inch. Some idea of what this engine could do. It was capable of lifting two flying Scotsmen on every stroke of the, of the engine, complete with the tenders. So that's some idea of, of the power output of these engines. A 90 inch cylinder working at over 100 pounds per square inch. Now, Richard Tvedic was more of a practical man that, than uh, a man that sat down and worked out theoretical reasons for particular problems. And this is the only authenticated drawing known to uh, exist that Richard Tvedic actually drew. Along with Edward Bull, an, en an engineer, he perfected the idea of, oper of operating this uh, mine pumping engine with a, without the rocking beam, connecting the mine pumps directly to the underside uh, of the cylinder. The, the, the problem was that it did infringe Bolton and Watt's separate condenser patent. But Richard Tvedic didn't care a lot for uh, James Watt, and actually didn't take any notice, and carried on making the engines. And uh, it, there, there is le there's letters uh, published at the time that uh, this energetic young Cornishman thinks not, uh, thinks very little of Bolton and Watt, and would do everything in his power to infringe their patents and being as Cornwall was such a long way from, from Birmingham, they, 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 they got away with it. Now that, that is, I've just put that in just to, to show that uh, the, this, this is the Levant Mine at St. Just, which is uh, now owned by the, the Trevithic Society, and uh, it is maintained and run for, as a tourist attraction. This is the large pumping engine, and this is the winding engine. And, and that is my wife sitting, doing a watercolour painting. Now, Richard Trevedic experimented with the high-pressure steam long before the, the Bolton and Watt patent expired in, two, in 1800. And this is the early, earliest known uh, drawing of that uh, engine that he, he constructed. I've, I've redrawn this because the original, it was not clear. So this is the first time that Richard Trevedic is known to be experimenting with high pressure steam. When I say high pressure steam, steam at about 45 to 50 pounds per square inch, which is considerably more than the, the Bolton and Watt engines, which of course, they were atmospheric engines. You were condensing steam that was only at about three PSI to create a vacuum. Don't be confused by the numbers that it says on there, on the sheet on there. These relate to my crib sheet. Th this is the, a drawing that is uh, it was made by Richard Trevithick's son, Francis, of, of the road locomotive. And when at this stage, I'd like to put this open to all of you. What is that? Oh, mate. What, what is that? Has, have anyone got any suggestions? I can't find out what it is. Don't know what it is. It didn't. It isn't shown on the. 
It isn't shown on this view, but what is it? You think it is? I don't know. I'll ask many people. I can't. Pardon? <laughs> oh, I don't think so. If you see the next one, you won't think it's a smoke deflector. The, the, in, 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 for 2001, the, the Trevithick Society made a, a road locomotive. The road locomotive uh, is shown here, nearing completion, in, in, in front of the Stray Park pumping engine. That, that is where Richard Trevithick spent a lot of his early, early youth. And this is the, the engine almost complete. And this is the engine on the 28th of April, 2001, ascending Camborne's famous hill. And that is the first, the first road vehicle in the world tra tra traveling forward by propelling its own wheels. That is the first. The next one shows uh, an engine done by Richard Trevithick in, uh, in, 18, uh, in 1800 at Cook's Kitchen. And just look at the simplicity of it compared to the Bolton and Watt atmospheric engines of the previous 100 years. It's very, very simple, using steam direct from the boiler. M many people say that Richard Trevithick was the inventor of high-pressure steam, but I've got a little bit disagree here because the patent that was taken out by James Watt in 1769 actually patented the expansive force of steam and prevented other engineers from using it until 1800. So he didn't really invent it, he used it after 1800. But there's not many people who will tell you that, especially the Trevithick Society. <laughs> but no, it... Uh, it was, he was eagerly awaiting the 1800 to come along to, to be able to use high pressure steam because James Watt in his famous patent of 1769 actually patented a, a sealed cylinder with, with a lubricated piston operating on a, on a pressure which prevented other engineers from using it for as long as the patent ran. It ran from 1769, it was extended in 1775 until 1800, r running for a total of 31 years. And, and of course that strandled technological progress for, for, for that long. That uh, is the, 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 the engine house today, which housed, which housed that one. Now, the, it's famous for, in, in 1813, con making the first railway journey of, of nine miles on the Penydarren, Darren, how do you pronounce it, Jim? Penydarren. Darren. <coughs> That's how I pronounce it. Yeah, <laughs> Penny Darren locomotive, and that is the Penny Darren ironworks at that date. Now, the engine that I'm going to talk about this evening is the one that you see there, made in, in 1804. But as surprising as it may seem, its very existence didn't become known until 1970. Now, John Ferry, who, who, who wrote his, his treatise on the steam engine at the beginning of the 19th century, wrote, wrote this massive uh, volume and it, and it was published. In 1970, David and Charles actually were commissioned to make a reprint of this, this tomb that had been done, and to their utter amazement, discovered that, that John Ferry had actually written it in two volumes and died before volume two got into print. So 
didn't very really much do that. That's, that's volume one. But he actually did volume two. But the manuscript of this was deposited in the patent office library where it was to remain undiscovered and, until 1970. And uh, so volume one and volume two were published for the first time in 1970. So th this engine that I'm going to talk to you about is there on page 14. And, th and that is the only known drawing that exists of this engine. You, you can tell that this document was all ready for the printers. There are, there are proof, proofreaders corrections in the margin. It was just about to go to, to print as John Ferry died. And it was left undiscovered until 1970. So there we are. We've got volume one and volume two. <coughs> And of course, that's the, the drawing that you see in, uh, in there, uh, and uh, is the basis of the research into that engine. Now, the research is absolutely un unbelievable because th uh, the information to actually make that came from Austria. And, uh, it, and the reason for this is a student contacted me one day that he was going through the, the archives of a, of a castle on the Austro-Hungarian border. And he'd found a document relating to a Trevithic engine that, that had been exported there in 183. And it wasn't exported there to do any what you would call a useful purpose. It was, you, it, it was transported there to ornament a fount, dry fountains in a pond in the front of the castle. And, and not only was the student able to help me with the, the documentation of this engine, he found the original bills of sale, which the Trevithic Society had been looking for many years to, to discover how it had actually got to Austria in the first place. And, and uh, all the, the papers that had been presented by the Trevithic Society were not correct at all, because I, I've, I've got it absolutely word for word, the price that was paid for it and, and how it actually got to Austria. It got there as, as, a, as a consignment of armament, because there was a there was an embargo on export at the time, and it was packed up in small boxes, and it got there. And it actually cost 250 pounds. Uh, and, and I've got all the men that went over from, from this country to assemble this in Austria, and, and the wages and, and everything about it. And, and I can show you a bit more. That, that is the, you can see that that's the crank. The, the model is a sixteen, not a, is a, is a tenth full size. All the other seven models that I've made are a sixteenth full size. It just looked a little bit too small at, uh, at a sixteenth, so I made that a, te a tenth. It's called a high-speed horizontal engine. I mean, high speed is 26 revolutions a minute. Uh, and and it's... It, it, its cylinder is positioned horizontally. And it is the first engine with the cylinder positioned horizontally. In the, in the 18th century, they, they, got, they got it fix, fixed in their minds, the engineers, that if they, if they laid the cylinder horizontal, they would wear the underside of the, the, the piston seal by the weight of the piston. So they, they always put them vertically. But of course, when they put it horizontally, it had no effect at all. But, but also, you, you can see the, the engine as uh, the engine has got a, 
a boiler with, with the cylinder incorporated. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so you can see that the, the cylinder is in the dome of the boiler. And it's in the dome of the boiler because the lubrication that would have been used in 1804 was a blend of tallow and olive oil. And of course, tallow, when it's cold, sets. So when it was up to a working pressure, it was hot enough, it had melted the tallow. And that's why it's in the dome of the boiler. And that is the, the Esterhazy Castle t in 2006, uh, being restored as a museum and hotel. And uh, th this is the information this Austrian student uh, was able to supply for, for me. Now, the, the, the owner of, the, of this castle was so enthralled with this, this engine that he'd, he'd commissioned, driving a, a fountain, he employed three operators to, to use it night and day on eight-hour shifts, seven days a week. He was so enthralled with it that he actually commissioned a model engineer to make a model of it. The engine, the original engine doesn't exist, but the model does. And uh, at this stage, I'd, I'd contacted the, the Michael Wright at the, the Science Museum uh, and uh, found that it was through Michael Wright and writing to the, the mu all the museums in Austria to discover where this model was. And it is in the Technics Museum in Vienna. And that is it. That, that is, is the model made in 1804. So is that the oldest piece of model engineering? Can you say anything di different? Of course, it still exists. It's, it's, in the, it's in the museum today. I don't really know. I don't really know. But uh, it... Uh, that this student was most enthralled that he, he could help with all this and, and verify everything that was done. Now, you, you can see here, uh, this is a, a, a recent photograph of, of it, and uh, very similar to how I've got it, but the, the, there are features on, on, on this that... Uh, have been credited to a lot of other people and not Richard Tavithic because Richard Tavithic was the person that developed the blast pipe. It wasn't Stevenson or Hackworth for the Rainhill trials. This, this engine that you see there had got a blast pipe on it in 1804, 26 years before the Rainhill trials. Uh, and uh, it was even called a blast pipe it, in very in fairies volume two it actually states the the beneficial effect of uh, ex discharging the the spent uh, steam into the chimney stack and, and seeing the the fire rekindled now that is a, a watercolor of the the engine house in 18 uh, in 1803, you can see the, the pool here that was, must have been in the gardens of the castle. And how the, and it, and it's said to have had a copper roof and marble floors, uh, and uh, it was genuinely, you know, this prince's pride and joy. And that's, and in, in, uh, in 18, in 2006, it was restored. And that's it today. It's been restored. It hasn't got the engine in it, of course, but uh, and that 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 is the the workshop area where, where where the model is thought to have been made. Just before I get to that one, I'd like to tell you a little bit. 
the development of, of uh, the high pressure steam engine by Trevithick was came to a little bit of a halt on the on the eighth of September, eighteen o three, because an, a small engine was pumping water from the foundations of a building on the Thames. The the operator of the engine wanted to extract a little bit more power out of it than normal, so he wedged the safety valve down between a, with a lump of wood between the safety valve and the ceiling, and must have gone off to relieve himself, uh, and left the engine unattended. Some someone else came and saw the engine running far faster than it had, it had ever been done before became alarmed and did the only thing he shouldn't have done, he stopped the engine without dropping the fire. Other people came to see what was, what was the problem. It exploded, it killed three instantly. And a person, one other died the following day from their injuries and many more were seriously injured. And that explosion brought about the formation of the boiler inspectorate because uh, the material that this boiler was made from, we all know today, would be very unsuitable. It was cast iron. Very good in compression, but not, but not in tension. It's in tension in the boiler. So, but before it became uh, legislation, Richard Trevithick had incorporated safety features into his, his engine He's, he's the first engineer to, to develop the fuse plug, which has been used on locomotives ever since. He, he, he also d developed a two, a two, a two safety valves that couldn't be, you could cheat one, but you couldn't cheat the other one, or, or vice versa. And uh, he got away with it and, and incorporated many more of his engines. And... Uh, as I say, he, he's the one that developed the fuse plug. Now, another student f from Austria contacted me. And I've, I've put this one in because I think you'll smile with this one. Because this was made in 18... 18, uh, eight, 18. He, he asked me if I could help him with the design of the engine, which I, I sent him sketches uh, of that. But there's something on this engine that you will smile about. Look here. It's got bricks. It's built it, fr from, <laughs> from this bulkhead across here to the, to the boiler itself. That, those are bricks. And on his model, of course, I sent him the bricks. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, I sent him a few thousand bricks for that. Uh, he, he, he helped greatly as well. Now, this is the first recorded application of the high pressure steam in, in 1725 by Leopold's. Where, where he got he got two cylinders positioned over the top of a domed boiler, with a, with a valve controlling the steam into each of those, where he was using the expansive force of steam to propel the the cylinders vertical. It's not known that if he ever made this, or is it just a an intellectual sketch, but I have incorporated it because the valve that's on the the Trevithick engine that you see there operates in exactly the same way uh, as this did, where, where it's, it's, a rotor, it's a rotary valve that turns through ab about 90 degrees to, to, play, to let that exhaust and then apply steam to the underside of that cylinder to propel them both vertical. And of course the the Trevedic uh, valve there operates in exactly the same way. And, and it's, it was very difficult to actually get that engine to, to work. 
because a rotary valve, when it's changing from one state to another, of course, there's nothing. And it, it may, it may, you can see when it's working, it's, it's interrupted. And, I, and the flywheel on that is much bigger than it, than it, than it should be to, get, to have enough inertia to get over that spot. But I've, I've also over, overcome that problem on the, on the engine operated that uh, it, in, into the piston I've put poppet valves that, uh, that hit the, the cylinder base and the cylinder head. So wh when it gets to the cylinder head, it lifts the valve off its seat and exhausts the, the pressure th through the piston to the other side and, and on, on the others as well. So that, that's got quite a complicated piston that it, it vents through the piston and, uh, and, that, and that's how it does it. And, and they have the, the, the same problem in uh, Ferry's volume two. He couldn't get it to work properly for the same reason and, and could put up, but he put a larger flywheel on it. But, could, but with, with models, of course, you can't do things like that. It, uh, you can scale physical sizes, but you can't scale inertia. So uh, I've put the flywheel on that as a little bit bigger than it should be. But uh, and, the, and, the, and the, va the, valve it's, the valve itself here is a little bit different than, uh, than, than, than you see here. In fact, you, you saw that puffing devil going up Camborne Hill person called Courtney Rowe in uh, and the Trevithic Society was responsible for, for that, knew, knew I'd done this and came to an exhibition where it was talking to me and he, and, uh, he, he actually said would I take that valve off and post it to them to, to, to see exactly how I'd done it. So uh, whether they copied it I don't know but it, the, the the rotary the valve that you see there has been down to Cornwall because it, it, it externally it looks exactly as Trevithic did it, but internally it's nothing like it at all. But but as you as you can see that uh, the this is the dome of the boiler uh, and the cylinder is within the, the dome of the boiler. Everyone been trying to make rotary valves work ever since, but they, they don't, do they? Now, Richard Trevithick got a friend and mentor, uh, D Davis Gilbert, who was a fellow of the Royal Society. He championed uh, Trevithick in many of his exploits. And he, he wrote a paper to the, to the Royal Society stating the beneficial effects of uh, ex exhausting the steam in, into the chimney of uh, the engine and uh, generally trying to give uh, Richard Trevithick the credit that he, he so uh, richly deserved. Uh, and uh, that's him. And uh, also, because Richard Trevithick was, I, th I think he could could really say he must have been the world's worst businessman because he would he would go to a manufacturing site tell the, the the owners of the site exactly how to make these engines and expect them to pay later which they didn't and uh, he died not very a very poor man Now, all the models that I've made, and there's, there's eight of them all together now, the, the other seven are a sixteenth full size. None of them are made from castings. Everything that you see is machined from solid. It's much easier to do it like that than make patterns and, and get them cast. Because, uh, well, I find it is that easy, much easier. Because to, there's nothing on that that's commercial. I've made everything that you see, every nut, pin, and washer. Nothing at all has been uh, 
cast only fabricated, but the next one will surprise you perhaps. The boiler itself is also machined from solid. That, that weighed 127 pounds as a blank of mild steel when it was put in the lathe. And by the time I'd finished it, it, it weighed 12. I've got to admit that uh, I did uh, ask a friend to hydraulically copy the external of the, of the boiler, and that's the, the template that was used on his hydraulic copying it lathe. But I did profile the internal of it by hand, and it was extremely difficult to, uh, to do that. Unfortunately, you can't see inside. I don't suppose it's a very good finish. But uh, the, the, the way I did it, I'd got the outside, I got the outside profile here at, at about eight millimeters centers, all the way from there to there, I drilled holes precisely five millimeters deep all the way around. And when I was turning blind, when I broke into one of those holes, I knew I was right. And, I was, and, and that's how I did it, all the way around. So uh, it, it took a long, long time to do that. And then of course, when, the, when I'd finished it, I just filled the holes in. And I have, just for a bit of uh, bravado, I think, really. We do, it has been tested to about 200 PSI, that has. But uh, the, the interesting thing about it, it was on display at, uh, at the Ironbridge Gorge Museum. And John Challen was in charge at the time. And, and he, uh, he went through the archives of, of, the, of the museum one day and actually came with, with a, a, a document relating to this engine and all the, all the parts that had been constructed at Colebrookdale for, for the engine, including the boiler had been cast at the, the Museum of Iron. And, and the one thing is that Richard Trevithick never paid for it. So, he paid for all the mechanical parts, but he never paid for the boiler. So, uh, so you can see that the, the this is the, the safety features on this are before the explosion. I I I I, I haven't incorporated <coughs> very comprehensive safety features, but. Uh, it, it took a lot of thinking out to do this boiler. So there, there we are. That's the the the, sec, the section uh, th through th th through th through, the, through the boiler. <coughs> and and uh, and I w once I'd uh, hollowed it out, I, I shrunk a piece a bottom in it and just silver soldered it all the way around, as well as shrinking it in. This is just, uh, just a small video of how the engine operates. You can see the, you can see the, the chain of the valve here. Before I built it into all, all the brickwork, I actually did steam this engine, and it's, it does actually st it did actually steam far better than it goes on compressed air. But of course, I wouldn't steam it now because it would just mess it all up. But that, it, it did steam. And they were deemed portable. These engines, they were they were deemed. I suppose they were really compared to the Bolton and Watt engines of the 18th century. They were not a structural part of the building which housed them, and uh, they were they, they moved them from site to site. I don't know if anyone else has called it the the Lambeth engine. It's just something that I've called it. That is 
from from all the research that I've done into it that uh, no one I've, I've not seen it written down as being called that before it what it, it's supposed to be what it actually did it drove the paddles of a dye house at Lambeth dye as in coloring cloth very, very light paddles to keep the color in suspension it it, it wasn't a high uh, high torque job it was just a, a high speed job and uh, it was deemed to develop six horsepower at uh, 26 revolutions a minute and uh, and that's, that's how it operated. So you, you can see the, how it's all been put together. The, the flywheel machine from Solid, the, the, those uh, Richard Trevithian, I know that that's perhaps just a bit of modeler's license putting on the, that on the, on the flywheel. But uh, the only reason I, I put it on is because I could. <laughs> <laughs> because they, it is, it is, they're not, it, that's not engraved into the flywheel. If you look closely, that is positive. I, I actually made a plaster mold w w with all the letters there. From the, ma from the plaster mold, I made a polyurethane mold. Car body filler into the poly polyurethane mold because the poly polyurethane is flexible, they pop out and dab them on with a bit of super glue. But the, the, the crafty little bit is that uh, there's nothing you can pick them up with. If you try to pick them up with any metal, they've got static and you, they won't let go. The, o the only way after many th much thought is to do is get a little bit of blue tack and, and rub it to a little point and just dab it on like that. That's the only thing that doesn't generate any static. So next time you do that, that's a tip for you. <laughs> so to, to put Richard Trevithick Campbell around there, the six weeks work. That, that's six weeks to do that. So. Just a, a, a better view of the of the crosshead, and, and the, the stroke of the of the original one is four feet, and the bore of the cylinder was eight eight inches. I, I've made this a little bit bigger. I've, I've actually made the, the bore of the cylinder twelve inches. The only reason for that is that uh, I've got a friend with a one inch home <laughs> that, 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 and it's, a six, it's six inches all the way through and it's very difficult to get uh, a perfectly parallel bore. That, that's been honed and it's one inch. You can see that uh, the, bo the boiler is, is, is complete, built into the, into the brickwork. As I say, they are individual bricks. Uh, for, for this specific engine, I had to make a set of hardened steel dies for, for the brick machine. They've only ever been used for this because you, you can see they're not the same bricks as on the, eight, on the 16th full size. These are much, much bigger because, uh, as I said earlier, I, I started to build it at a 16th full size, but it just looked a bit miserable, so I... I thought I'd get it a bit bigger because I did want it to work exactly as it did.
Now, in, in 2004, the, the coin that you see there was struck to commemorate the, the, the railway journey. There, there, are, there are two coins that are on the, on the model that you'll see there. And uh, that, that's one that was the Penedaran lo locomotive that was made at, at Ironbridge. I can tell you ever such a funny story about that. I live at Stone, and, there's a, and there was a, a, a fella from Eccleshill that did all the drawings for that. And to say that he was a bit strange was the understatement of the year. He, he, li he, lived, in the, he lived in this bungalow quite a way away from everywhere. He converted his loft into a workshop where he made varying models but he couldn't actually get them out of this loft. <laughs> and, and, he, and he constructed it like the old mills with, 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 a, with a beam going through the end gable, and he lifted them out and lowered them down with, with a crane. But, but, but in his front room, he, he got all the drawings for, for, for this. And uh, his name was Stuart Johnson. <laughs> but uh, I couldn't believe it when I, when I saw how he lifted these engines out and he got a spiral staircase from his dining room <laughs> up into the loft. He was Sindel. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the Catch Me Who Can, which was uh, recently discovered to be on the site of... somewhere... Where was it, Jim? Near Houston, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, and that's the, the the railway ticket for the for the journey. And, and that is a, an artifact that was found on uh, and is now preserved at Colebrook Dale, which is a, a, the the powering cylinder of a Trevithick engine. And you can see how small it is in diameter uh, and uh, on the long stroke. Now, th this, these are, you, you can see that this is uh, the, the East, Pool, East Pool Mine, where the, the engine that you see here is that, and this now is the center for an industrial tr trail around Cornwall. And for those who uh, might be concerned of what the bike was that I was riding at the start, that's it. <laughs> that's something I've recently restored. It, uh, Makes, makes me smile when I go out on it and wakes the neighbours. <laughs> now, uh, only this morning I've uh, t taken delivery uh, of uh, all, all the research that I've done throughout the 45 years. I've, been, I've documented as I've gone along and put it all in chronological order. And uh, that has been... Uh, Proof put put in, in in book form. It's been read by Birmingham University. Malcolm Dick has been very kind to have read read through it, through a manuscript, and has also written very kindly a forward to it, which I, I'm very proud of. And I took delivery of the these books two hours before we came here. I didn't actually think I would have got them here in time. It's a hardback book. There, there are 420 illustrations. There are over 150 drawings that I've done. There's 140 colour photographs. And, and that's it. it was, that was two hours before we came here. So if anybody would like a copy of that, I've got quite a few of them. So that's it. 
straight off the press. So that's, that's Richard Trevithick's engine. Any questions, please fire away. How much is it? It's <laughs> 35 pounds. 35. I can keep it down, keep it down low because it's not going to go anywhere in, into a shop. I'm going to store it. I, I've, I've published it and uh, that way the pr price can be kept down because uh, no one else is going to get anything out of it but me. So there it is. As I say, I'm very pleased that Malcolm was uh, volunteer, volunteered to write this forward, which is a very complimentary appraisal of it. So. As usual, uh, there's a good opportunity for questions now, which I'm sure uh, that talk will have generated. Um, there are a couple of roving microphones, and it's helpful both to us down the front and to your fellow audience members to hear the question if you can get hold of the microphone before you start uh, making any comments or anything. Um, and also, as you know, we do, so we do attempt to video these um, talks and uh, the sound quality is quite good on the videos even if the uh, image sometimes doesn't come out wonderfully because of the, the distance that the camera is but, but um, uh, the sound is only, only comes through if you do have the microphone so, um, and also if you don't want to appear on the video then you know, keep, keep uh, a low profile uh, <laughs> it's mo mostly it's east of the backs of your heads but, uh, but anyway so I just thought I'd warn you um, so any any questions just today? One yes, thing I, just yeah, one yeah. thing I'd like to say. Yeah. I, I'm, for those that don't know, all 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 the models that I've uh, done over the past forty five years have been left to the Black Country Museum, which which uh, when they've done their new reception area are going to be on permanent display there, and uh, I think that won't be until about two uh, uh, two thousand and twenty. But uh, in, in the meantime, if anyone wanted to come and see them, they're, they're, all, they're all on display at my home at Stone. People are most welcome to come. I can, I can handle up to 10 people, and uh, you can get a cup of tea and some biscuits and, and thrown in as well with that. Yeah, we, we organised a, a visit yeah, from the yeah. Newcombe Society there last summer, and, uh, which I went along, and that was great fun seeing all of them in the, together. So... Uh, so, uh, there was somebody with a question up there, I think. Uh, oh, thank you, David. Thank you very much, David, for that excellent uh, talk. I always enjoy your, uh, your uh, illustrations with the models. It's no accident that uh, the Esterhazy uh, uh, that dynasty in, in Austria, they, they were the actual uh, patrons of the Haydn, uh, Joseph Haydn and, and later Michael Haydn, and I'm sure they, they invested in the latest technology as well as the, the, the best uh, music in the world at that time. But a question, David, in the Telegraph one day last week, when they were arguing about the GKN uh, takeover by the... the uh, the, the group was taking it over. There was a photograph of a Trevithick locomotive between that dated between the Penny Darren machine and the road machine before it, and it was a replica that, that's made somewhere. And I think it was made by the Guest Company. That's why they're featured in this article. Can you tell us anything about that, please? I'm sorry. Can anyone else I help me on that one? Somebody, yeah. Is anyone help? Just get the mic. Just get the microphone. Just, just coming, and then uh, if you can add something, that's useful. I understand from the uh, picture that was there. You said it was uh, made in 2002. Yes. So that's all I know. It just shows you a picture of it. There was somebody I'm, driving. I'm, yeah. I've not seen it, but yeah. unfortunately, I can't help you what it is. I, I have not seen it. So it sounds like it's a fairly recent replica yeah. then. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes. Uh, I've heard you talk before, and uh, I think they're marvellous models that you've made, but I understood from previously that they were mechanised models that moved but didn't actually operate by steam. But you made reference to tonight's uh, engine as though it had been steamed or could be, yes, could be steamed. Well, could you clarify that for, for all your models, whether they're yes, steamable or not? When you, make, when you make models of 18th century engines, which are atmospheric, they're, they're so inefficient at a model size, you just cannot get them to work if you want them to be authentic in appearance. You, you, they would have to be a, a much greater scale than, than I've made them at, and, and I wanted to make them exactly how they were. They, 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 they do go through all the motions exactly as they would have done, but powered by compressed air or a vacuum. Mm. But uh, no, I can't, you, you can't get an atmospheric engine to reliably steam. No. A, and, and when you've gone to so much trouble that I've got, would you really want to throw oil and water all over that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll put the... I'll put. Oh, dear. Um, three things, David. The um, high-pressure steam... I think Dennis Papon was using that about 1,700... Yes, he, the, um, he certainly managed to get water pushed up thirty-five, up seventy feet, which sounds to me like about thirty-five psi, which whatever its merits was high then. The um, models, early models. It looks as if Germany might have a very early Papan model. But you'll hear about that probably in two years' time. Yes, when Jim Ranahan gets his act together for the next for the year after next <laughs> and the third thing is the um, <coughs> cylinder and piston that you showed of the ingestory engine ingestory engine which was in the science museum and is now back in the science museum stores i think it shows what richard Tavert was up against with high pressure steam and no means of sealing it the very long piston which simply had to be wound around with tallowed rope to seal it. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. I've got an admission to make here, the, 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 the seal in that PTFE. <laughs> but but if, I, if I hadn't have told you that, you would have never known. <laughs> Oh, uh, sorry. Um, did he have a, a, a pump to recharge the boiler? Yes, he did. You, the, you, if it were, at the end, uh, well, I'll, I'll run the engine for you, and, and it, it has got a water feed pump. It has. It's got a. It will be the the, uh, the first high pressure water feed pump on any engine, and it is driven from the crankshaft with, with an eccentric. The eccentrics, you, you can see that clearly on the engine. Yes. Hello, comments about the, uh, the size of model engines that can be steamed. Um, around about three to three and a half feet for a Newcomen engine model for the height is just about the absolute minimum, but it's quite tricky to keep it going, I understand. And I'd said all of this, I mean, I've six years ago at Black Country Museum on the 300th anniversary of the first engine there. And uh, afterwards, I walked around the corner and down me, there was a two and a half foot high Newcomen engine running. <laughs> and I looked at this and I thought, how do you manage that? It's got a pickle pot condenser on it. And that is rather like Watt's condenser. Um, and so it was able to immediately double the, different, the pressure differential because it was really condensing properly. Whereas, of course, the Newcomen engine, uh, to get a reasonable speed, couldn't drop the pressure below about half an atmosphere. Uh, 
But as David says, you know, you are really on the limit. And if you want then to try and use scale size valves on the small engines, exactly the same as with IC engines, if you get hold of a, a, a small petrol engine, you realise that the carburetor's got a thing a hole through it the size of your little finger, although the scale size would be a sixteenth of an inch. So scale factor's really quite critical on all of these as you move down. And uh, it's wonderful that David manages to work these on compressed air or vacuum because in some cases even that's a bit tricky for getting it in. Um, and hence, very often in museums, of course, they, they finish up by putting electric power on. Mind you, they can be a bit devious how they get the, the movement in there from the, from the motor. On every, all of the engines that I've made, I, I wanted to make them appear exactly as they would have appeared in the 18th century without m missing anything off. And uh, that, uh, hopefully, I've done. If you multiplied any of the engines that I've made by the scale factor, you'd have the real thing. There is no doubts at all about it. And uh, that, that was my aim right from the start. No matter... The, the nuts and pins and things like that on, on the engines are a little bit out of scale because when you're making an engine, say, at a 16th full size, and they're... they're, they're, they're the ones that are at a 16th full size are all in buildings with, with windows and doors, and they've got locks on the doors as well that work. <laughs> uh, and uh, a, a, a screw, you wouldn't be able to go down 16th full size, would you? But, but what, I, what I've done, I go down to 14 BA, which is pretty small. I go down to 14 BA, some idea of the size of 14 BA, I put a thread on the end of a paper clip. That's 14, the 14 BA. And, uh, and thread the end of it and use it as a stud. <laughs> Pretty small. But, but for, when you make all the, the rest of the engine, in proportion up from that, they look all right. But if, if I'd put, made it to scale, I wouldn't be able to put anything on at all. But it, no, would it, no one would ever notice unless I told them how, what I'd done. Because I don't even miss a screw off the door. <laughs> yes. Fa um, fascinating talk. Thank you. I was just wondering, you mentioned that the um, Trevesic, Trevesic's engine was, the parts were made in... Um, Ironbridge, were, were all the all the part, parts for the engine made in Ironbridge, or did he have a local? No, they they, they, se they seem to be made. There, there was a lot made at Heaths in Stoke on Trent at Middleford. Mm. There, there was an iron foundry there. He he would he would travel around the country, instructing manufacturers exactly how to make these engines, uh, and with a rudimentary sort of. Uh, pay scale for, for them, dependent on the size of the cylinder and the job that they were doing. But, but he never really policed this uh, effort. He just relied on the, their honesty to pay him. And of course, they didn't. Uh, and uh, this is why he, he was such a, a poor man at the end. Did he have any anything locally in Camborne, any sort of foundry or anything like that? I don't that? think he did. No. I, didn't th I don't think he did. Other than when he was working for the mines, he, he, before he branched out, because he never had a manufacturer of his own, he just relied on others. So he, he hadn't got a concentrated manufacturing site. Right. How would he have transported it then in those days? Horse and cart or, or down the river? Well, there the the must have been, or? I mean, the, bo the boiler on, on that uh, would have been quite a, an effort, wouldn't it? I mean, it, it, it was cast at Colebrookdale. To, to have got that boiler to London was uh, quite a quite a feat in uh, eighteen four. And to get it down to Cornwall, you, you could yeah, get, you could yes. go by river so far, I suppose. Could yeah. You? So, and they, they made many of them, and they were all cast iron. When he got all these safety features on, as I say, it brought about the formation of the boiler inspectorate. 
There's one other thing I wonder if you could answer. Um, one of your s slides sh showed the Vitalik mine down at yes. St. Just. And it said that it was a copper mine. W was it just copper or was there tin there as well? There was tin and arsenic. Oh, there was tin? Yes, and arsenic. Yeah, the, right. the, 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 one, uh, the, the one mine in the, in the background, the, there's a, a spoil heap there, and uh, it was last used as a spoil heap well over 100 years ago, and there's not, there's not even a bit of lichen growing on it, <laughs> because, of course, it's a spoil heap from arsenic. And uh, when, when we were down there doing the, the research into it and talking to the locals, what, what they actually did... They, they went to this this spoil heap, ri riddled some of the whatever you'd think call it, and put water with it uh, and put it on the paths in the in the allotments <laughs> to stop the weeds. <laughs> and, 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 that, and that's after 150 years. <laughs> it sounds like in I used to live near uh, an asbestos yeah. factory near Cambridge, and the farmers in the, the 50s and 60s used to put the the waste asbestos on all their tracks and just run over it. And, and we used to go for walks along these tracks in the country so and nobody thought it. anything more about it, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, one up on this side, and then I'll, then I'll take it, another one up there. But first, first one on this side. Yeah. Could you tell us a little more of the metallurgy that is available to, to Trevithick? The, well, the, the, boy, the boy that was cast iron, <coughs> all, all of the parts would, would have been wrought iron, Made locally by blacksmiths, uh, the the flywheel wa was cast in. Some appear to have been cast in sections. Some appear to have been made how I've done it. I, I did it like that because it was easier than making it in parts. But uh, some appear to have been done like that, and some appear to have been done by sections uh, with the the outside rim bolted in in, in segments. But uh, they he treated any parts. I, do, I don't think so. I don't no. think so. What uh, about copper alloys? Were they used? They, they would. They, they would have had bronze for for yes. the the stuffing boxes and things like that. Mm. But uh, n nothing else. I don't think. Uh, okay. Thank you. And Chris up top there. Yeah. Hi, Chris Hogan. David, thank you for a stunning talk as always. Uh, your modelling skills are legendary. I'd like to particularly credit your 45 years of early engine research, which is of major importance on its own, quite apart from the model building. Uh, just a few little points to add. You talked about this engine as being high speed at 26 RPM. I've been interested in this business of engine speed because most beam engines at the time are typically only doing, say, 11, 12 strokes a minute. I was very surprised to learn that Murdoch's bell crank engine first developed in about 1798, actually ran at 40 RPM. So it's interesting that Trevithick was using a lower speed, and I wonder why, because if a Murdoch engine can run at 40, quite successfully at the time, then certainly a Trevithick engine could have. So that's an interesting difference. We must talk further about this. Yes. Uh, we've been researching, uh, I gave a paper here jointly with Bill Whitehead about the research we've been doing on the, the helper engine at Upminster Mill. I think you came to that one? Oh, but we, we had an engine there running at 40 RPM, driving millstones that ran at about 120 RPM, so the gearing ratio was 3 to 1. Uh, the gentleman <coughs> was mentioning a few things about <coughs> metallurgy and about difficulties of transport. Uh, there are plenty and plenty of photographs in the archives of 40-ton <coughs> beams being delivered in the later years of Cornish engines. You've got engines with 90-inch cylinders, 40-ton beams. They're all being delivered by horsepower occasionally by traction engines, but you, you simply have a team of 20 horses and then you have a team of about 50 men on winches to lift the thing 30 feet in the air to get it up and over the top of the engine house. <laughs> so they, they simply use, you know, it's just a matter of throwing enough animal power at it. Uh, the other thing is we've got this extraordinary feat, which uh, David didn't happen to mention, that uh, Trevithick supplied a number of his engines to the silver mines in Peru and Mexico, and some of these were installed at about 3,000 metres altitude, <laughs> and all of the parts were broken down to be small enough to be carried on muleback. <laughs> it, it's all in the book. Yeah. <laughs> the book. There you go, yeah. Advert for the book. Yeah. 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 <laughs>
Uh, presumably what's also in the book is Trevithick getting stranded in South America and being rescued by Robert yes, Stevenson. Yes, it's in the know, book. So, uh, we, we, which you simply couldn't make up, you know. <laughs> Trevithick ends up penniless, more or less, in, trapped in South America. He has to walk across South America to get back to the East Coast and then hasn't got enough money left for the, for the boat home. Who, who should he meet one day but Robert Stevenson who happens to be out there? Stevenson gives him the money to get back to England. You couldn't make it up. <laughs> Yes, the microphone's just coming. Yep. Just making its yeah. way around the back. You have a gear, sh uh, a gear wheel on the end of that. What was that powering? Because, you know, I don't know. I've, <laughs> I've just put it on. To, to, I don't know what it would, would, have, what would have, how it would have driven anything. I've just put it on as a gear that would have driven something. Uh, it's, that is model's license. <laughs> and looking at the wonderful machine you've got for the bricks, uh, for the modelling the bricks, mm, yes. you're cutting off... Is that cutting... Uh, are you firing the bricks after you've cut them like that, or how are you making the bricks? The bricks are made from dry powdered clay. The, the, the press... Uh, Presses four each time. It, it, to press four bricks at a sixteenth full size, it needs five and a half tons of compression to, to for the, the firing to be successful. It, it is it just dry powdered clay, and and then I uh, take all the rough edges off them, and then they fired using the same atmospheric conditions which would have been used three hundred years ago, wh wh when coal would have been used as the heating element because you'll see the bricks there are all different colours. There's no paint on that model, other than the metalwork. There's no paint on those bricks, and they're all the same clay. It is just how they were fired, how, how they would have been done, in this case, just over 200 years ago, but in the Newcomen engines that I've made over 300 years ago in a coal-burning kiln. Because when the, the need for he, heating the... The, the clay up, up to 1,100 degrees, burning coal, the combustion of the coal would have consumed the oxygen around the firing zone, and that, and that would have fused into each brick the carbonaceous matter and, and made them almost uh, zero water absorption. You know the, the, the blue bricks up, up to damp proof course on old houses, or on older houses, that would be the same clay as the ones above. They would have been fired in an atmosphere depleted of oxygen to make them water absorbent, uh, zero water absorbent. So instead of putting a damp proof course in. So the, so the blues were just the same clay? Oh, they're just, just the same clay. They would have been fired in an atmosphere depleted of oxygen. These models could not have possibly have been done if I hadn't got the, the knowledge that I've had from the pottery industry to develop everything that you see here. If I'd, if, I, if I'd have been interested in making these models and I hadn't have had the job that I did at Royal Dalton developing these machines, they would not have been possible. Oh dear, you stole all my thunder. I was about to say how modest you were because... I remember possibly other Newcomen's auspices making a visit to B B Dalton way, way back and you showing us this one and dropping out casually that, well, you should develop the method of making plates from clay powder and therefore it was second nature to you. So when I saw how you were making bricks, it was, it was common sense. But as yes. I say, you were hiding a light under a bushel. <laughs> the, 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 inter the interesting thing is that I made... That, that brick making machine that, that you see there, at the same time as we, we were introducing into the pottery industry dry powdered uh, technology. And I was responsible for the development of these machines. They were made in Germany, but I was jointly responsible for the design of these machines. And uh, a patent was taken out for the method of operation of my brick machine which was applied to the machines that were used in the pottery industry. <laughs> because when, 
when you're developing something at home, you've got to make it with what you've got, haven't you? You don't. <laughs> and and uh, I found a very simple way of, of, of metering the, the correct amount of clay each, each time, and, and that was applied to the full-size machines in the pottery industry. <laughs> and, uh, and the machines were supplied from Germany without all this metering device on, which we put on, which is a copy of my brick machine. <laughs> <laughs> and did Royal Dilton pay you royalties on that? Well, it was my, it was my, I've got yeah. 17 patents, but yeah, yeah. it was my job to do that. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was my job. Uh, I don't know whether we're nearly finished, but uh, I've been looking at this model for some little time now. And there's a humorous aspect to it that I can see, and I don't know whether it was intentional or just um, accidental, but uh, looking at the model from where I am here, uh, the top of the chimney, I think it's got a grill on the top, has it? Yes. Looks like a hat. And below mm. that, there appears to be two eyes, then a nose, and then a mouth. A a, 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 a I can't say that I've ever really thought about that. <laughs> You'll have to look at it from my direction, at the top of the chimney. All right. A humorous face. Yeah. Well, this, yeah, is, right. this is perhaps an opportunity to draw the questions to a close and let, and let uh, uh, David run the model with us, you know, gathered close. But, oh, one more question? Just right. one last okay. question. Yeah. Has Trevithy got any descendants? He, the, his, his son did that, uh, the drawing that you see of the road locomotive. Uh, I don't know much about his descendants at all. No. Uh, all I know that uh, I, I, I worked with, with, with someone and, and, he, and he brought me a birth certificate one day. He says, look at this. And it was some descendant of Richard Trevithick on the book and I've got it at home. But I don't really know the, the, the relationship or, or the connection here with this other than I've got this thing. And somebody I'll work with. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Right, well, let's um, say thank you to, to David with a good round of applause. Um, I think uh, Richard Brosh has just got a...